What's happened here? Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Game Changers Experience with myself, Adam Strong. I'm excited to be here with you on the show. We're doing a live show, by the way. Uh, so you're going to be able to hear us on YouTube, on, on LinkedIn Live, and on Facebook, of course. And for a bit of housekeeping rules, of course, for you guys that are listening into the live show, use the hashtag live, use the hashtag replay. That'd be excellent. And, um, you know, today's um, today's guest on the show is someone who's already who's turned into a really good friend of mine. We've known each other for a good few years. And um, originally from Australia, based in Taiwan, got an amazing family. And uh, we've collaborated on numerous different projects from podcasting through to summits. Um, literally, like, Dan Tolson is an absolute game changer when it comes to things like emotional intelligence. Uh, and more, more importantly, it's helped so many thousands of leaders and entrepreneurs like you guys uh, about how you can create those breakthroughs using emotional intelligence as a strategy. So, uh, by the way, if you've got any questions or any comments, the comment section, uh, comment section, please use the comments here down below in the streamline. Make sure that you're following me and Dan over on LinkedIn and on YouTube. Click on subscribe or follow and make sure you hit back that bell notification, which is in the top right hand corner. If you guys that are listening to us on the podcast, we're going to be putting all these show description notes below, of course, so that you don't miss out on anything that we're going to be talking about. Because guess what? We all live uh, live uh, busy lives, don't we? Anyway, so I'm excited about today. So let me give you a bit of an overview about who Dan is and uh, what we're going to be covering today, ladies and gents. So Dan is a business coach by trade, uh, but he has a specialism like I mentioned to you, with emotional intelligence. He's dedicated to the, the best part of 20 years of his business career, his entrepreneurial career, in becoming a master and an expert in the world of emotional intelligence. Now, what he does is he shows entrepreneurs and leaders and helps them to create an awareness how you guys can use your emotions to create those breakthroughs, to be able to increase your wealth, to be able to improve, increase your level of success, or whatever it is the goal or the objective is in your life. And, you know, because this means so many different things to so many different people, right? And has helped over 20,000 business people um, over the uh, during his time and his tenure as being an entrepreneur and as, as a coach. Uh, and in, in order to create those breakthroughs in new income levels. So what are we going to be talking about today, ladies and gents? Okay, well, we're going to talk about, we'll go back to the basic fundamentals, first of all. What is emotional intelligence for you, just for you newbies that not sure what EI is. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but we're also going to be talking a little bit about why it's so important to regulate our emotion and how we can how we can use that to our advantage and be able to take that into the business world because that's really about kind of like going in deep like you know with my guests they love it because i'm challenging but for you guys this is what you're thinking about right but if you have any questions of course feel free to use the uh, the comments in the comment section below we're going to talk about the uh, the 4p and the c that everyone needs to master we're going to be talking about motivation and and also passion and what the differentiation be between the two and how they're linked. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about artificial intelligence and emotional intelligence, how the two are linked and how they can play against each other or in collaboration with each other. And we're going to talk about what, what ACEs are. So lots of things that we're going to be covering on today's show. And uh, I'm excited. I'm pumped. I'm far much more energetic than I was on the previous show, um, <laughs> but we won't even go there. Anyway, listen, um, I've got to bring the main man up himself, um, Mr. Dan Tolson. Welcome to the show. My brother, thank you for the beautiful introduction as always. And it's uh, it's been a long time. Uh, I remember yeah. the big events we've done during COVID and impacted a lot of lives together. So beautiful to be here with you today. Thanks for having Absolutely. me. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate it. And love your salt lamp, by the, by the way, in the background. It's to keep all the bad juju away. <laughs> <laughs> That's the technical name, the juju. <laughs> the juju, the juju. How is life treating you in Taiwan, by the way? Is it good? 
it's uh it's hot it's humid and it's sweaty it's the uh, it's the tropics at this time of year. So I was in the park today, thirty two degrees and probably about seventy six percent humidity. Damn. So I was uh, sweating without a workout. It's a little bit like cheating. I feel like I've been working out, <laughs> but I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> I totally get it. I totally get it. One hundred percent. Yeah, I think it's like monsoon season, isn't it? Coming into that kind of arena of time of the year, isn't it? Yeah, plenty, plenty of rain, big winds, and a beautiful time of year. Because once Love that uh, big storm comes through, the beautiful big blue sky comes out. Amazing, yeah, very cool. Love it. But listen, I mean, it's been a it's been a while since we we jammed on here and had a bit of fun and stuff like that. But I mean, I mean, how's life been treating you? It, it, it's treating you well, or life's good. Life's good. It's um, it's bringing more challenges than I ever imagined. <laughs> <laughs> What's you, know, you? <laughs> you go through your 20s and 30s and you feel like you're invincible and you feel that you know once you get into your 40s everything's going to sort out and everything's going to be okay uh, i think the dream that we've been sold is that business is going to be easy we've been sold that we're just going to do one thing and it's going to take care of everything but the game gets harder yeah. and we're going to constantly upskill so for me uh, there's bigger challenges and bigger obstacles, and um, I don't feel that I'm ready for it, but I don't feel like I've got a choice either. Uh, in business, no. once you decide to get into business, you've got to accept that reality. So yeah. it's it's fun, it's challenging, it's disappointing, it's sad, you feel angry, you have excitement, you have a win, and then you get up and dust yourself off and go again. <laughs> so that's how yeah. it is. That's entrepreneurship for you, my friend, you know, and uh, well, we're still around after all these years, which is good. And I'm, I'm so glad we have the opportunity to, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, because we were having this dialogue offline. And so we had Adam Cox. I, had a, I was in London last week with Adam Cox. And honestly, I swear to God, I sounded like Kermit the Frog when I was interviewing him. <laughs> and it was kind of like I didn't know whether it's I was I was talking or choking. Um and uh, you know, thank God for for my amazing editing uh, team as well. Um, but literally, like, oh, it was because it is like hay fever, hay fever season, and and it kind of that shift in season, and it really bummed me up. And you know, because we were gonna jam last week and stuff, but it just wasn't gonna happen. Um, but it was the only time that I could meet Adam anyway. But anyway, so I just wanted to kind of say that my voice is now cleared. We can have a good conversation, and it doesn't feel like. You're speaking to Kermit the Frog. <laughs> <laughs> ribbit, ribbit. Anyway, so let's get into um, let's get into the juicy stuff, man. I'm, I mean, it's been uh, it's been a while since you've been on the podcast and stuff, and and I, I know that you know your uh, background is all around emotional intelligence, and I, I feel like because we've got so many more listeners now, especially in the world and stuff like that, and you know, emotional intelligence is a bit of a fancy name. Like it's been floating around the industry, but most people really truly don't know what EI is, do they really? And how to apply the skills and principles of EI in business and entrepreneurship. Maybe you could give a bit of a snapshot for us. Well, my mum was in porn. My dad was in porn and we owned a porn broking business. And we used to call it being street smart. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we called it <laughs> years ago. And today, you know, emotional intelligence is a buzzword. And uh, you hear 70% of Fortune 500s are training their people in emotional intelligence, and people still really don't know what it is. It's okay. really about being street smart. And you can break it down into five pillars. The first pillar is self-awareness. That's just about knowing yourself. The second pillar is self-regulation, which is being able to control your thoughts and your feelings. The third pillar is motivation, but we refer to it not as the Tony Robbins jump up and down motivation. It's more resiliency. It's about getting knocked down and getting back up again. It's hearing a no on the first sales call of the day and you go through another 25 sales calls and you hear no, but you don't lose any enthusiasm. So it's that resiliency. There's also the social awareness and that's understanding why others think and feel the way that they do. And in a business, if you don't understand how people think and feel, then you can't make sales. And then finally, there's social regulation, which is your ability to communicate with others. 
And I think we've all been in a relationship before where the person that we're in a relationship with is almost emotionally disabled and they can't communicate their ideas or thoughts or their feelings. So emotional intelligence is really knowing yourself and knowing other people. And that's the basis of it. You know, it's interesting because what I love about what you've just said there is you've put it into such simple terms, you know, and go, stripping it right back to simplicity because I feel like there's so much fluff out there which you can complicate stuff, right? But you just kind of condensed it into a really layman's term, simplify, condensed version. So I just want to say thank you for that. I appreciate that. That helps me and our Homer Simpsons of the world to really understand that. <laughs> anyway, Adam, anyway. because when I when I learned about um, emotional intelligence and things like public speaking, there's mm. so much complexity in the world, but mm. it takes a true artist and a true master to be able to break it down. And our goal as a communicator is not to make ourselves look smart. That's not the goal of communication. The goal of communication is to communicate your ideas in a way that other people feel smart. And they go, mm. I, I, I get it. That's the goal. Our goal is to make our audience feel smart, not to make mm. ourselves look smart. And I think that's a big problem in today's world. So, yeah, we've got to yeah. simplify it. Make it easy to understand. Mm. I guess uh, what, what really kind of uh, can go wrong is people's ego because, uh, <laughs> you know, when, when, when you add ego to the mix, emotional intelligence doesn't really work, does it? Well, we have two different per personality types. We have our natural style, which is who we are in the presence of our family and friends. We can relax. It's at home when you're walking around in your underpants. <laughs> you know, you're not worrying <laughs> about judgment. And then there's the adapted style. And it's where we put on the suit, we put on the mask, we put on the makeup, and we become a different person. Yep. And we show the world a totally different side of ourselves. And that confuses people. But it also confuses us because we say, I was at home feeling comfortable, and now I've got to become a totally different person. Mm. But it feels like an act. And we feel incongruent on the inside. And I learned this when I was 19. My coach and mentor in real estate, he said, Daniel, you can't have two hats on. You just got to wear one hat. Let people know who you are on the field and off the field and just be consistent. And he said, when you do that, you'll also have a lot of internal congruency. You'll feel better. You'll feel more confident. And it does take time to learn to do that. And I think all of us have to do that to play a better game, especially in 2023. Absolutely. Yep. hundred percent agree. We on that one. Good stuff. If you guys are uh, listening into us live, by the way, use the uh, hashtag live, use the hashtag replay. And if you have any questions for me or for Dan around the whole world of emotional intelligence, feel free to use our feeds. We are streaming here on uh, YouTube, LinkedIn, and on Facebook, of course. And if you are following us on our, those channels, make sure that you subscribe and follow us and make sure you hit that notification so you don't miss out on any uh, any any events that's going on. So it's all good. Anyway, um, let's get into the nitty gritty stuff now. So let's talk a little bit about um, what, okay, let's talk a little bit about, um, well, regulation of our emotions, should we say, in business. Like why is, first of all, why is it important to regulate our emotions, right, when running a business? And, and maybe you've got some case studies uh, or, you know, maybe some clients that you, some examples that you can give us. Why is it important, number one? And what's the point? Mm. I think the biggest fear that gets in every entrepreneur's way is the fear of rejection. And it impacts 99% of the population. So when you start a business, now you've got to promote yourself. You've got to talk about your products you got to talk about your services. And every time you talk about your product and service and your movement, you know that people aren't going to agree with you. Mm. And so with this fear of rejection, people start to have a lot of anxiety around that because they start to think to themselves, what if somebody rejects me? What if somebody asks me a question and I can't answer it and I look like a fool? <laughs> and before they even start, they feel that fear. 
So when it comes to regulating, if you experience that fear of rejection or that anxious feeling about somebody could possibly reject you or criticize you, that feeling is going to impact your performance for four hours. So what's a real world example of that? Well, a real world example of that is most salespeople don't pick up the phone till after lunch. Mm. So the first four hours of the day, that fear of rejection gets into their bloodstream and they start to avoid the phone. The one thing that makes the money, they start to avoid. They put it off, they put it off, they put it off, but they justify it. You know, I'm getting my list together. I'm thinking about the high value prospects and I'm going to talk to them first, but let me just grab a coffee. You have the coffee, the bowels open up. Now I've got to go to the toilet. (laughs) And why would I make a call now? Because everybody else is going to lunch at 12 o'clock. So I'll go and I'll have my lunch and I'll come back at one. They're absolutely exhausted. The circadian rhythms kick in and they want to sleep because they're lethargic. They've got a full belly. They haven't done anything for the first five hours of the day. But it's because that fear has got into the bloodstream. And because they can't regulate the behavior, they go into avoidance behaviors. Mm. Let me write an email. <laughs> Let me do a <laughs> Facebook update. <laughs> Let me just check in with the wife. They do all the avoidance behaviors. And it's because they can't regulate the emotion. Mm. And then what happens? It has a trickle effect because the fear then interrupts your time management. If you can't regulate your emotions, you can't manage your time. And then the average salesperson, which is a business person, they sell for less than 90 minutes per day. That's it. 90 minutes of face-to-face selling. Everything else was just wasted or put on low-value activities. So that's a real-world example of how fear impacts you. And it's also a real-world example of what happens to people because they can't regulate the emotion. Mm -hmm. But for the high performers, the people who can regulate it, You've heard it said before, feel the fear and do it anyway. They go, I don't like this feeling of rejection. I don't like the anxiety that I'm feeling. Screw it. I'm going to do it anyway. And they pick up the phone. And then by the time you pick up the phone at two o'clock, everybody else has been sold just because somebody regulated their emotions better. So if we master that, then the sales come in and we don't have to make excuses about money anymore. (laughs) Mm, love that love that so that's a, that's a really good example actually and uh, i i can definitely um i mean i mean when we do in our sessions with with individuals and stuff i can def- i mean just from past conversations you know it's you know you, you kind of think i suppose in a way procrastination is a, is is fear because fear is paralyzing fear of rejection that's where procrastination is that it, but it's 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 kind of like a knock on effect to everything isn't it it's not just what you're so what you're saying in a nutshell dan is effectively your emotion if you can't regulate it it doesn't just affect your productivity and everything else it affects everything that is attached to what you're doing on a day-to-day basis but also the outcome that you're that you're destined to to want to achieve. You're not never going to achieve it, right? We create these knee-jerk responses because all human behavior is just a pattern of behavior. If I come in on Monday morning and sit down and have a feeling of rejection sitting in this seat and I repeat that pattern of behavior, what will happen as soon as I think about going into the office sitting, sitting in this seat, it'll trigger the emotion of fear mm. before I've even done anything. Here's an example. Working with a guy a couple of years ago, and his boss rang me. He said, this guy's costing me $100,000 a month in opportunities. Wow. And I said, what's happening? He said, his job is to make prospecting calls for the first two hours of the day. Okay. And I said, what does he do? He says he doesn't do the calls. And so I started to talk to the guy, and I said, what is it about that you, what is it about the calls that you don't like to do? He said, I hate the telephone. And I said, this thing scares you. And he says, no, that doesn't scare me. I said, well, what scares you? He says, it's the person on the other end who's going to say no to me. So he sits down, he feels fear. He looks at the phone, he feels fear. And then he starts to play these pictures. Somebody's going to say no to me. And so with anxiety, what happens is you imagine situations turning out 
unsuccessfully in the future. That's the anxiety. You see something in the future turning out unsuccessfully. You feel anxiety. You go into avoidance behaviors. Mm. But he had repeated that and he trained himself successfully to have anxiety every day. It just happened every day automatically. So our thoughts influence our feelings. And it's the feelings that decide what we do and don't do. So as he imagines, imagines, hasn't even happened, hasn't even picked up the phone, as he imagines somebody rejecting him, he feels fear and anxiety. Mm. And then he goes into avoidance behavior. So once he learned to change his thoughts, automatically the feelings changed. Mm. And once the feelings changed, he started to pick up the phone. Now, the interesting thing, he had the skill, he had the knowledge, he then developed the attitude and the regulation abilities, and he started to make 60 telephone calls a day. Damn. Within 30 days, he called me up and he said, this is the best selling month I've ever had. I said, what's changed? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'm not scared anymore. I said, you're still scared. You've just regulated the feeling. And he goes, absolutely. He goes, I can manage it now. And it turned his life around. Six months later, he called me and he said, Daniel, look at this. He had a video call, like a WhatsApp call. And he said, look at me. I'm driving across the country in a convertible. <laughs> Where's the bloody invitation? <laughs> he said, I'll call you next time. Love it, love so, it, yeah, love it. Change your thinking, change your life. Definitely. Love that. It's a, it's, it's a really good example. I, I, I think it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a good one. I like that. It's good stuff. So question. If we, if, if some of our listeners are... I don't know. You've made them aware that maybe their emotions or their fears are holding them back. Are there any type of activity, activities, tasks, or questions that we have to ask ourselves, whether it be our subconscious mind or anything in particular, to disrupt how we can regulate our emotions or rewire ourselves so that we don't get paralyzed? from the fears and et cetera, et cetera, or how we could change that situation. Any thoughts there? Well, the first step, and if everybody remembers this, if you can't name it, you can't tame it. So you have to get clarity on what the exact fear is. Right. So let's talk about four common fears. Now, each of these fears we have to treat differently. Just imagine a builder. If a builder has a nail, he has to have a hammer to hit that nail through the timber. Yep. If the builder has a screw, then he needs a screwdriver to screw it into the wood. So we need different tools to deal with different problems. The first fear that we all have to manage in business is the fear of being taken advantage of. This is the first fear. And how it shows up is in a leader, we say, I'm building this business. I'm getting busier. I need a team, but I'm afraid somebody's going to take advantage of me. I'm not going to delegate because they might not do it correctly. I'm not going to employ people. Why aren't you going to employ people? They might steal my ideas. They might steal my money. But you know what? <laughs> There's a little bit of insecurity in there and they go, what if I train them and they leave? And what if they become my competitors? <laughs> what if they outsell me? And so it's that fear of being taken advantage of. You know what it, you know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. 100%. I was only speaking about it the other day about it. That's the first one. The second one, and we talked about that before, is the fear of rejection. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to present your product and service and you're going to have to risk getting rejected from the marketplace. That's natural. That's normal. It's part of the game. However, you're also going to resist get uh, resistance internally from your team members. Your team members are not going to follow your instructions. They're not going to buy into your mission. And you're going to have to face rejection on a daily basis. It's nothing personal. It just goes with the territory. The third one we're going to learn to manage is the fear of losing our stability. Now, I would say this is probably the biggest one because a lot of people never go all in. Mm. 
They're in transition all the time. I'm just pivoting. I'm just transitioning right now. They've got one foot in the door with their old job, and they've got one foot in, not even a foot, a toe in the water in their business. And they've got this plan B. If this doesn't work out, I can always go back to my job. And here is the biggest problem is uh, I said to a lady the other day, Adam, (laughs) she asked me, she said, Daniel, I really want to join your program. And I said, beautiful. I said, let me ask you. I said, out of one to 10, how committed are you to changing? She said, 70%. (laughs) And I said, 70%? Yeah, look there. And I said, let me ask you. I said, you're a mum. Can you be 70% pregnant? <laughs> she looked at me and said, what? And I said, can you be 80% pregnant? She said, no. And I said, can you be 90% pregnant? She said, no. And I said, can you be 99.99% pregnant? Now, you're a dad, Adam. Your wife's either pregnant or she's not, not pregnant. Exactly. I hope she's you're not. either in or you're out. And there's no in between. And people are stuck in that gray zone with a foot in the door in their career and a toe in the water. Mm. And they become their own worst enemy. And it's because of that fear. I'm going to lose my stability. I might try. I might fail. I might lose my money. God forbid. What will happen to my ego? (laughs) What would it say about me if I failed? So I better have a plan B. And then the fourth fear is the fear of making a mistake. Mm. It's the fear of doing something wrong and then being criticized. It's the fear that you feel when you present your product and your customer who's very technically minded asks you a question and you get blown out of the water and you go, how the hell do I answer that question? (laughs) (laughs) So you try to use your personality to get out of the problem. Then you bullshit for a while. Yep. And people fear that. But what they could do is they could just regulate their emotions. So the mm-hmm. first step, Adam, I love the question. It's just we've got to name it before we can tame it. And once we learn uh, to name it, then we can go into regulation. Yep. Very cool. Love that. Some good stuff. Guys, I hope that um I hope that uh Daniel was dropping well, Daniel was dropping some massive value bombs here. So if you uh, have a question for him, feel free to use the the the, the feeds here, of course. And uh, if you if you don't have time to listen to us live, that's okay. Head over to the podcast, listen to it on Apple, Google, Spotify, whatever your po- preferred podcast platform is, and you'll be able to listen to us uh, when the episode comes out. Anyway, let's switch. So we're talking about this whole kind of PNC. Like, what is PNC? I I've never heard about this. What is this? PNC. What what is it that people need to master around PNC? What's that mean? A psychologist in San Diego once said to me, she said, Daniel, she said, I want to talk to you about four things. I said, okay, what are they? She said, how do you approach problems and challenges? Ah, problems and challenges. Ah, ah. So I thought about that. And she said, how do you approach people and contacts? Well, I had no idea. I used to knock on doors. Is that an approach? And she said, how do you deal with the pace and the consistency in the environment? Hmm. Never considered that. She said, how do you deal with policy and constraints? I said, I've got no idea. And she said, well, you've got no idea because (laughs) this is where she really slapped me. She said, Daniel, 85% of the population claim to be emotionally intelligent, yet only 15% are. And I quickly went from the bucket of 85 and she put me in the bucket of 15 and she very politely slapped me. So these P and C words, it's really about knowing our behaviours. So all of us have different ways to approach problems and challenges. Now, for you and I, Adam, we're former athletes. We're champion athletes. For me, if there's a problem or a challenge, I throw myself right into that problem and challenge jump into it head first. And I want to tackle those problems and challenges head on. Mm -hmm. But not everybody does it like I do. I'm very competitive. I want a big problem. I want a big challenge. But other people avoid problems and challenges. And this is what I started to learn, is that when it comes to dealing with problems and challenges, 
all of us do it in a very different method. And that was one of the biggest wake-up calls for me. So when I started to deal with problems and challenges, I realized that I was very daring. So I would jump in and I'd try to solve problems that were far beyond my capacity. And I kept falling behind. And that was my first Mm -hmm. mistake. I also realized that other people approach problems and challenges and they did it in more of a cautious way. Mm-hmm. They were more cautious when they were approaching problems and challenges. But the interesting thing was you could be daring, you could be argumentative in approaching problems and challenges and still get the result. The mm-hmm. same result as the person who's more cautious. But what we've got to be able to do is we're going to understand how do I do it? And then we've got to make sure we set our goals in a way that aligns with our personality traits. Mm -hmm. So every day, all of us have to solve problems and challenges. And if you put yourself into an environment that's very argumentative, but you're more of an agreeing person, you're going to have what's called an environmental conflict. And it's just where your behavioral style doesn't suit the environment. And Mm. you'll know it because your stress levels will rise. So that's the first thing we've got to solve, problems and challenges. Mm -hmm. In every business, we've got to deal with people and contacts. And this is where I made some really big mistakes at the start. So for me, I get drunk on optimism. (laughs) I am so optimistic. You know, the, the, have, you, have you heard the joke about the optimist who committed suicide? I have not. <laughs> he was over in Kuala Lumpur and he went up the KLCC, up the Twin Towers. He went up to the very top and he threw himself up, off the top of the tower. And That's he comes it. flying down towards the ground. Gravity's pulling him down. And at the observation deck, somebody looked out and said, how's it going so far? <laughs> and the optimist <laughs> put his hand down and he said, so far, so good. <laughs> Splat on the ground. So for me, I've been too optimistic, taken on too much too soon and believed I could achieve these big goals just because of ego. But what happened was I wasted time. I lost money. So albeit optimism is a great trait, we can become drunk on it. Now, on the opposite end of the scale, some people interact with people and contacts in a very sceptical way. A leader doesn't trust their team members, so they don't delegate. A salesperson doesn't trust the customer, so they never fulfill the full deal. And so these P and C words really impact everything that we do. Now, if I'm in sales and I want people to feel enthusiastic, optimistic. I want to be able to generate that emotion inside of them. And that might work for a salesperson. Mm -hmm. But you don't want an optimistic accountant. Hey, how are the numbers looking? Pretty good. Did you check them? I trust you. (laughs) You want an accountant who's skeptical. I don't believe people. I don't trust people. I believe in numbers. Okay. (laughs) Now, if you can know that about people, You can have very good team selection. Mm. So they're the first two. Problems and challenges, people and contacts. Very cool. Love it, love it, love it. Some good stuff. Um, What was I going to say? Motivation. Because I'm not a big fan of the, uh, the word motivation. I'll be honest with you. But I know that it plays an important role in, 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 in emotional intelligence. Of course it does. Difference between passion and, and motivation. I'll, would you say that they're pretty much the same? Or would you say that there are key subtle differences between the two? And yeah, I, I, I'm just kind of curious to know what your thoughts are on that. Hmm. I struggle with the same thing, Adam. I heard all this motivational stuff, this seminar stuff, <laughs> jump up and down. My wife and I went to T. Harvecker's event in Taiwan, oh, yeah. and it was called The Millionaire Mindset. And every five seconds, you had to turn around and say, you've got a millionaire mind. High five. Turn around. You've got a millionaire mind. High five. Jump up and down. Say, woo. Oh, so and I looked at my wife and I said, I have paid for VIP tickets. 
And I said, I ain't doing this. <laughs> I said, that's not motivation. I said, I don't know what that is, but it's not for me. So I was confused for a lot of years because I thought that's what you had to do. I thought you had to bring this energy into business. Now, I used to have a, a sales team in Sydney, and uh, I thought they were eating uh, powdered donuts <laughs> until I realized they, were, they both had sinus problems. And they were jacking themselves up. They were getting motivated in the bathroom, Woo, ready for sales calls. And I thought to myself, that's not motivation. So I went in the search for the, for the answer, and uh, I found that motivation can be broken down into three components. The first one is biological motivation. And if anybody tells you that they're motivated, believe them. Everybody is motivated. Biological motivation is just the need to survive. It's to wake up in the, in the morning and go to the bathroom. Mm -hmm. If you want to see a motivated person, look at somebody who's got a full bowel and has been sleeping for 12 hours. They will do <laughs> anything to get to the bathroom. That's motivation. But it's the absolute basic motivation. Once people have their food sorted out, their shelter sorted out, those biological motivators have been taken care of. So if somebody says, I'm motivated, believe them. But it's to what extent? The second type of motivation is what we call extrinsic motivation. This is when we set a goal to buy a house. We set a goal to buy a new car. We set a goal to go on holidays. And what we do is we work towards these things. But I think everybody's had the same experience is that you get really excited about buying a house until the repair bills come in. You know, I've got a friend, he's a multimillionaire in the United Kingdom. He said, Daniel, I grew up in this little flat in a housing estate. And he said, the dream was to have a stately home with an automatic gate. He said, but now that I've got it, every time the, the, the door, the gate breaks down, I've got to pay a thousand pounds to get it fixed. <laughs> he said, the roof leaks, I've got to get it fixed. The grass has got to get cut. And he said, now that I've got the stately home, the goal is to live in a small flat once again. <laughs> and I think we've all had this before. You buy a house and then you've got to deal with the repairs. You buy a new car. You don't let anybody eat KFC, McDonald's, fried chicken in there. Nobody's allowed to fart in your car. No smoking in your car for the first six months. And then what do you do? You can't smell the new car smell anymore. The motivation disappears or even worse, your next door neighbor gets the next model up. <laughs> Shit. So all of these things are extrinsic and they have a very short lifespan on that motivation. Extrinsic motivation is also reward and punish. And so a lot of business people are probably feeling like this. I've got these big goals. I've got these big aspirations. I've got this big vision. But because of COVID, because the way that the world's working now, I can't achieve what I wanted to achieve. All those physical things are now out of my reach. What happens to the motivation? <sighs> It's like somebody's let the gas or the air out of your tires, disappears. And I think we've all been there. The next level of motivation that goes beyond that, this is intrinsic. This is where your passion comes from. This is when the fire on the inside is so hot that it radiates outside. It's when you wake up in the morning and you're doing exactly what you love. You're living life on your terms. You're doing the type of work that aligns with your personality. You're working with people who make you feel great about yourself. And secretly, you would even say, you know what? Even if I didn't get paid to do this, I'd still do it anyway. <laughs> and every day, you're living life on your terms. And that's where that passion comes from. Mm -hmm. And when you meet somebody like that, it doesn't matter if they've had a win or a loss, they have no loss of enthusiasm. And that thing that they want is attainable only inside of themselves. It makes me feel so good because what I want is over there and I'm on the path. Some days I take a step forward. Some days I go a couple of steps back, but I'm still on that path. And they get up and there's no loss of enthusiasm 
as they go from challenge to challenge to challenge. And that's that third level. And if we get to that, which is very easy, that's when we get to have passion every day. Like now, right. it's yep. 7.45 from me. You're a businessman. You're off the clock today. I'm off the clock. But we're talking about <laughs> topics that we love. And I probably won't be able to sleep after this. I'll be rolling over at one o'clock in the morning going, ah, that was great. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. Yeah, it's it, I, it, I, I'm, I'm with you on this one, brother. Definitely, hundred um, percent. It's interesting because I know that um, you know technology has really accelerated over the last twelve months now, hasn't it? And, and I think that you know, um, especially with like AI coming in and automation, and you know, there's just technology is moving at such a fast pace. I'd love to get your um, you know, the, I suppose, get your, I suppose, opinion around how it kind of like AI, artificial intelligence versus emotional intelligence, how they kind of like potentially could coincide with each other versus rather than kind of seeing them as separate entities. How can we help us? I suppose, how, how as entrepreneurs can we help uh, ourselves with our EI, but using AI as potentially as a tool or as a resource to be able to do that? Does that make sense? Mm, mm, it does. Many years ago, I worked in corporate. So I worked for some big banks in Australia. And I also worked with Emirates Airline. And I'd heard about these people who you'd call a D. Oh, that person's a D. That person's an I. That person's a C. And that person's yep. an S. And I heard about this model called DISC. And the first time I heard it, I was really turned off. Because I thought, why are you classifying all of these people and putting them into these little boxes? Mm. And so I'd heard about it, and it turned me off. And then I was introduced to it again in 2016, mm. and it turned me on. I was like, oh, my gosh, this science, this disc, this is incredible. So I took a disc assessment, and when I took it, I was on a computer program, and I just answered a series of about 24 questions. Now, when I got my DISC report and this psychologist debriefed me, I was absolutely blown away because when I got my results, it was like somebody had a CCTV camera in my house following me around, checking out all my behaviors, and I was blown away. And so I went down the rabbit hole and I have completed more than 10,000 scientific case studies using things like DISC and emotional intelligence. And when I started to use it, a lot of people used to say to me, you know, Daniel, could I put in a false answer? Could I put in a fake answer? You know, I've done these assessments before and I can manipulate it and I can answer it any way that I want. Now, I don't know why someone would want to do that, but there's logic behind it. The logic is you could make yourself appear any way that you want. And so I went down the rabbit hole again and I discovered that that is called a bias. So you can have a bias and you can say, well, I want to make myself sound like this for this job interview or in front of these people. And I thought, well, DISC has its place, but there's human error and there's potential biases. So coming through COVID and before COVID, we had started to experiment with different technology. And thanks to COVID, this technology that shifted really quickly was we went from doing paper-based or computer-based instruments where people would answer a series of 36 questions to measure their emotional intelligence mm -hmm. to being able to use voice recognition technology. Mm -hmm. So because of COVID, the, the technology shifted and now what we can do with voice recognition, we can get a 90-second voice recording we can measure people's brainwave frequencies that are found in the voice. So imagine this. You're in the UK. It's summer. You can see the sun, but you can't see the UV rays. But your skin is getting burned. Mm -hmm. You talk on the mobile phone. You can hear the other person's voice, but you can't see the radio waves. You put food in the microwave. It comes out hot, but you can't see the microwaves heating it up. Mm -hmm. So... With technology today, the microphone can pick up our brainwave frequencies in our voice. 
and it can measure our levels of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. And it takes 90 seconds. You don't answer any questions. <laughs> you don't say anything specific. You could count from one to 100. You could count from 100 to one. You could do it in any language because the technology measures the brainwave frequencies. And it can measure what's called your emotional blueprint. From the final trimester in your mother's womb up to current age, we can identify all the significant emotional events that have taken place throughout your life. Wow. We can predict your personality type. We can predict how fast or slow you're going to move. We can predict your fears, your anxieties. We can have a look if you're a extrovert or an introvert, mm. all based on AI technology. In the results, 90 seconds. Absolutely mind-blowing. Full wow. game changer because of COVID. That's crazy. And, you know, I mean, that just blows me away. I mean, I haven't explored the whole kind of AI space that much, if all, in all honesty. I mean, SGBT and, you know, you've got, uh, I don't know, Bing have created one, Google have created one, and stuff like that. But mm. I, I don't know. I, I think... Uh, I think we're going to, uh, do you know what? I reckon there's going to be a new fear that's going to be coming. It's going to be called the fear of embracing AI technology. I think that's going to be a new one that we're going to have to put in our new workshops now. What do you reckon? Well, I think people should fear it. And what I say, Adam, in business, when it comes to emotional intelligence, fear is not always negative. Mm. Because when you're afraid, sometimes that makes you move. You get out of your comfort zone. Mm. So there's two types of motivators, fear and desire. Mm. In terms of motivational force, desire has a motivational force of one point. Mm. But the fear of loss is two and a half times more powerful than that of desire. And we know this as parents. When you say to your children, clean up your room, and you come back an hour later, nothing's changed. What do you do? Clean up the bloody room. I'm going to throw in your game boy. <laughs> Two seconds later, the, the, the house is spotless. And you think to yourself, why did I have to yell and scream and sound like Voldemort? But then you think to yourself, hey, this fear of <laughs> losing something actually works. Have you noticed that as a father? Uh, <laughs> hey, do this and I'll let you stay up for 30 minutes versus don't do this and you'll be grounded for two weeks. The fear of loss is more powerful. So, yeah, people should fear. AI, and it'll actually get them out of their comfort zone. It's actually a good thing for them. <laughs> That's a good analogy. I like. I, I like that. It's, it's a good way of putting that. Anyway, I am uh, conscientious of time because I know that time's getting on. And uh, but listen, I mean, we, we, we're talking about some really deep subjects here, ladies and gents. And um, um, you know, like I said, I, I, I'm me and Dan could pretty much talk for hours on not on this topic but just nice. in general we just have <laughs> ease and stuff you know what i mean so um but um what i was going to say to you if, if you have any questions again feel free to use uh the comments in the comment section below and if you if you need to leave a question and we'll uh and you're not going to get a straight answer from the replay that's okay we'll come back to you it's not a problem uh and we'll uh um, on whatever it might be uh for you guys that are listening in on the podcast of course you can follow uh, the show description notes below. And what I was going to say to you guys, make sure that you follow Dan over on social media. If you have any questions for him, uh, feel free to reach out to him. Him and his team will be more than happy to get back to you. Now, I know um, I was going to say, Dan, you're working on something as well, which is kind of exciting. Tell us a little bit about your, your little project that you've just launched. Well, which one should I talk about? 100X DNA? Uh Mental detox, uh, which one? Higher sense, what do you reckon? Which one? Uh, uh, well, I was going to say to you, actually, the uh, the, the AI software uh, that, you, that you were creating, right? Mm. One of the things that has really blown me away over the, over the last um, 12 to 13 years is how emotions really impact the decisions we make. Right. See, a lot of people... When we grow up, we grow up in a household <laughs> where we're told what not to do. Don't touch the stove. Don't play outside. Don't date that girl. <laughs> Don't get into a car with that boy. And our whole childhood, we're told 
what not to do. And so we start to have all of these fears and those fears turn into self-limiting beliefs. And these limiting beliefs are the bullshit stories that we keep telling ourselves why we can't have what we want. I'm too old. You know, the people who said I'm too old, what they say? I'm too young. The people who say I don't have enough education, later on in life they say I'm overeducated. And they have these series of bullshit stories that they just keep telling themselves throughout their life. I'm not worthy enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not skilled enough. You know, a guy said to me, he said, I'm too Asian. (laughs) That's what he said to me. He said, I'm too Asian to succeed. And I said, well, (laughs) let me add that one to my next book. And so we tell ourselves all these bullshit stories. And what I realized is that when we started to use this AI technology, it could pinpoint times of our life where we had a significant emotional event. And it's when we have these significant emotional events that we start to make limiting decisions and have limiting beliefs about our life. I'll give you an example. One lady that I was working with, at age seven, her father, who was educated, wanted to start a business. And he went out and he started to sell But then he got objections. Salespeople are uneducated. Salespeople are slimy. Salespeople are going to sell you something that you don't want, you don't need, you can't afford. And so after having that experience, he quickly went back to the comfort zone and he went back to his corporate job. That just paid enough to pay the bills. And he said to his family, never start a business. Salespeople are the lowest people at the pyramid. Our family doesn't sell. So he went through his entire life. He struggled for money. But that one experience, which was a significant emotional event, where the father lost all of their money, they lost their house, they were sleeping in the car, it impacted the children. And so the children started to grow up thinking, I can't succeed in business. If you're not educated, then you're not worthy. Salespeople aren't worthy. And in her 50s, she got into selling. And the biggest problem was not the market, was not the economy, was not the product, was not the service. It was her mindset. Mm. She tried affirmations. That didn't work. She tried a new product. That didn't work. (laughs) She had to realize that the biggest obstacle was her. And once she overcame those self-limiting beliefs, the following year, she made a couple of hundred thousand dollars in sales. Wow. The exact thing that her father had bred into her that was not possible for the family. Mm. And you know what added insult to injury? When she Mm. went and said to her father, Dad, you wouldn't believe it, just made a couple of hundred thousand dollars in my own business this year. And he said, I believe in you. I knew you'd be a great businesswoman. (laughs) And she went, yeah. Because her whole life she thought it was not possible. (laughs) She thought she was programmed that it wasn't possible. And here the father's the biggest cheerleader. Yes. (laughs) So, yeah, (laughs) I call the program Mental Detox. And uh, (sighs) we detox our body and we've got to detox our mind. So that's the big project we're working on. And Mm. we want a million business people to be free from self-sabotage. That's what I want. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. You know, you know what what I love about our conversation, and for you guys that are listening, if you haven't spoke, uh, listened to Dan before, what I love about it is that he's so passionate about what he does, like literally so passionate about what he does. Not only is he credible and has years of experience in this, is that he truly, truly, authentically loves to help people uh, with this challenge you know because it is a real problem in the real world ladies and gents and uh if you're listening to this and uh and you're thinking oh maybe that, that maybe that that will benefit me you know if you have any questions or if you have any uh or even if you're I- intrigued reach out to dan that's all i was going to say to you guys so uh but anyway um we need to wrap up um i'm conscious of time i just want to say thank you so much for being on the show today dan My pleasure, mate. It's always a pleasure to be here. And um, I love the impact that you're having. And you're nonstop. COVID didn't stop you. You got bigger through COVID. And uh, what a great leader for everybody here at the Game Changers. Well done, mate. Proud of you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. 
Well, listen, guys, hope you've enjoyed today's show. Uh, make sure that you uh, subscribe and listen in uh, on me and Dan's uh, LinkedIn, YouTube, or Facebook channel. And uh, make sure you subscribe to, if you're the first listener to hear on the podcast, of course, make sure that you subscribe, hit that subscribe button. And, you know, like I said, we always welcome feedback. Write a one or a five-star review over on Apple or on Spotify. Really greatly appreciate you. Anyway, from me and Dan, I hope you enjoyed today's show and uh, hope you have a great day, week, month, whenever you listen to this. Take care and we'll see you soon. Cheers, everyone.